Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm going back to The Beat by Alan Parr because, if I'm being honest, this dude is delightfully charismatic, which is troublesome when you pair the charisma with bad ideas. And ideas don't get much worse than slavery, which is the topic of today's video. And speaking of charismatically presented bad ideas, I have a sponsor today. And I just realized how that sounds. No, I don't mean they are a bad idea that I am charismatically presenting. They have a product that deals with what might be bad ideas that can sometimes be charismatically pre You know what? Just watch the thing. It's a good product that I actually use myself. In today's world of online media and news consumption, it can often be difficult to figure out where all the different news outlets stand and what biases they might have. Sure, there are some whose biases are so obvious that it hardly needs explaining, but how do you know when a more moderate news outlet might be spinning something to suit their narrative while avoiding certain inconvenient facts? Wouldn't it be nice if there were a tool that you could use that would allow you to easily compare the same story as presented by different media outlets while simultaneously showing you what biases those different outlets have? Enter Ground News. Ground News is a news source comparison platform that gives you the power to see how news outlets with different biases are reporting on a story so that you can easily see the difference in reporting and come to your own conclusions. What really sets this service apart is the ability to see your news blind spots, as if you have an unbalanced news diet, there will be stories that you simply don't see no matter what side of the political spectrum you find yourself on. It's a great tool to have if you are interested in getting the full story and forming a better understanding of reality beyond your filter bubble. Ground News doesn't use algorithms to send you into a feedback loop of only seeing stories that reinforce your existing bias, and the news comparison feature makes it easy to access the same story from multiple political perspectives, increasing your ability to cultivate a balanced news diet and allowing you to suss out which parts of a story are true and which are political spin. Ground News is the news aggregating app that you can recommend to friend and foe alike. Take control of the news that you are shown and get the full story by downloading the free Ground News app. Click on the link in the description below or find them on the App and Play Store. Ground News. You may lean, but your news doesn't have to. During the darkest era in the history of our country, many Christian slave owners would use the Bible to support slavery. Yep, in a brilliant display of how the Bible can be made to say whatever it is you want it to say, Christian slave owners were able to use the Bible to justify their ownership of other people as property, and Christian abolitionists were able to use the Bible to justify their position that slaves should be freed. And if I'm being honest, I think the people using it to defend slave ownership were actually closer to its real position than the abolitionists, which then supports my idea that the Bible is not a book that you want to use as your source of morality. But the question remains, what does the Bible teach on this subject of slavery? That's coming up next. Well, it teaches slaves to obey their masters. It teaches masters that they can beat their slaves as much as they like as long as the slave can recover in a couple days. And in the New Testament, it could be argued that Ephesians 6 would have the slave owners stop beating their slaves, but it is pretty clear from the context that this only applies to the Christian slaves. It teaches all sorts of horrible stuff about practicing slavery. Well, what I want to do is I want to give you seven facts and show you how slavery in the Bible was very different than the slavery that was practiced in our country. Does it matter if it was different? Gentle slavery is still slavery and is morally abhorrent. But given the verse in Exodus about being allowed to beat your slaves to the point where it can take them a day or two to recover, I'm going to go ahead and say that Bible slavery wasn't really all that gentle to begin with. Number one, God did not create slavery, but rather he regulated it. And so just like there were laws about murder and theft and polygamy and divorce. Well, let's see. The law about murder is don't. The law about theft is don't. Polygamy and divorce are a bit more complicated, as both definitely have instances where they are permitted, but I would say that slavery as a category fits in more closely with the laws about protecting the sanctity of life than just marriage laws. It's more like the murder one. So given that it is such a severe issue with significant negative consequences, I would expect that slavery would be an issue where a law about it would just be don't. Maybe God could have skipped one of the four commandments that basically amounts to Yahweh is awesome and instead included thou shalt not own slaves in its place. 
God knew that the hearts of people were evil, and so he had to establish laws that would regulate slavery and ensure the proper treatment of slaves. The proper treatment of a slave is to set them free. Anything less is heinous and immoral. And so the very fact that there is a law about it at all indicates that God did not approve of it, and it wasn't his perfect will because God did not establish laws to regulate or limit good, only to regulate evil. By that logic, God doesn't approve of us worshiping him because otherwise he wouldn't need laws regulating his worship. I know the response to that is likely to be something along the lines of, no, it's the lack of worship that he doesn't approve of, so that's what he's regulating. But really, with any moral regulations, if that's your line of argumentation, this tactic can be used on either side. It's actually the evil of not owning slaves that God is regulating. See? I can do it too. That's just not a good argument. And with apologies to those of you who are listening to this in podcast form, link in the description for those of you who aren't aware that I do my videos as podcasts as well, there's a lot of text that is coming up in this video that Alan never verbally addresses. So here it says that skeptics will argue that because there are laws about slavery in the Bible, then God must approve of it. That is not what I will argue. I actually don't care whether or not God approves of slavery, because I don't think God exists. But if God did exist, then he had the ability to make the law about slavery just be, don't do it. But he didn't do that. He chose instead to tell you how to do it. The fact that he allows it means that he is permitting something that is incredibly immoral. He doesn't have to approve of it from a moral perspective to condone it from a legal perspective, and the Bible absolutely does condone slavery from a legal perspective. Number two, the purpose of slavery in the Bible, as we're getting ready to see, was actually designed to help the poor survive, which was the exact opposite of what was practiced in our country for nearly 400 years. Was it? Was slavery designed to help the poor? Maybe poor Hebrew men, but everyone else kind of gets screwed in this arrangement. Like, a poor man might sell himself into their indentured servitude version of slavery, but if a man has a daughter, he can skip being a slave himself and just instead sell his daughter into slavery, where she doesn't get to go free after six years like the men do. Now sure, there are protections for the girls built into these laws, but a better protection for them would be a simple prohibition against all slavery. And yes, if there is a marriage involved, the slave girl suddenly gets the rights of a wife rather than a slave, not that that was much better, but marriage Marriage is by no means a guarantee in this scenario. Verse 8 is pretty clear that it's her job to satisfy her owner. And given that the rest of this passage is about marriages, not any sort of menial labor, what do you think is meant by satisfy here? And then if she fails to satisfy her owner, he must allow her to be bought back again and cannot sell her to foreigners. But if her father sold her to escape poverty in the first place, how likely do you think it is that he will be able to buy her back again? And even if that were the norm, it's still hugely immoral, and yet the Bible permits it. This leads me to my third point, which is that in the Hebrew culture, slavery was primarily volitional. Notice the qualifier primarily there. This leads me to suspect that Alan knows about the verses that tell you you can get permanent slaves that don't go free after six years from the nations around you and from the foreign residents that live in your country, including the ability to bequeath them to your children as inherited property. Yeah, that whole they go free after six years and voluntarily sell themselves into slavery to escape poverty thing, that's only applicable to Hebrew men. Women are permanent slaves, children born into slavery are permanent slaves, and foreigners can be made permanent slaves, and the women and children of an enemy city become slaves if the Israelites conquer that city. If the city surrenders, though, then everyone gets to be a slave, including the men who otherwise just would have been killed. So even if you are right, and that the majority of the slavery that happened in ancient Hebrew culture was the still immoral but slightly less so debt slavery, the other kinds of slavery still happened and are explicitly permitted. So in other words, if a person was too poor to provide for themselves or if they were in debt, they would oftentimes hire themselves out to someone who was richer who could provide for them or pay off all of their debt. Yeah, not a great system. Slightly better than being forced into it at sword point, but as the sword point forcing still happened and was also allowed, this is nothing but an attempt at a distraction. Others would choose to be slaves to ensure that all of their basic needs were met by their master. Alan, come on. Really? Is that how we're doing that? 
You're showing Exodus 21 verses 5 and 6, but you literally are replacing all of the obviously immoral and heinous parts of those verses with ellipses. So as Alan is presenting it, Exodus 21, 5 and 6 says, But if the servant declares, I love my master and I do not want to go free, then he will be his servant for life. Okay, that sounds not too terrible. Not great, but not too terrible. Now let's read the verse in its entirety, including the previous verse that is directly leading to this situation. If his master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master, and only the man shall go free. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. So, Alan, why did you skip the part where the reason he's declaring his love for his master is because his master is literally holding his family hostage and then driving an all through his ear as a permanent mark of his status as a permanent slave? Is it because it makes it obvious that this is not actually a voluntary choice, but one made under duress? Why you gotta edit the Bible verses to make slavery look not bad if the slavery in the Bible is actually not bad? Either way, slavery in the Hebrew culture was volitional. Tell that to the wife and kids that are being held hostage to get the man to agree to becoming a permanent slave. Which leads me to my fourth point, which is that kidnapping, according to Exodus chapter 21, in any and all circumstances, was completely and totally outlawed and punishable by death. And yet, Leviticus 25 verses 44 through 46 describes how you are to go about kidnapping slaves from the nations around you or from the foreigners who live among you. Now, if we pop over to Deuteronomy 24 for a sec, verse 7 makes it clear that there is a death penalty for kidnapping a fellow Israelite. And since this part of Deuteronomy is basically a retelling and fleshing out of how Moses brought the law to the Israelites in Exodus, the laws that are presented here in Deuteronomy that have equivalent laws in Exodus can be taken as essentially being the same law. So in Deuteronomy, it explicitly says that the rule against kidnapping only applies to Israelites, while in Exodus, that part is implied. I might be wrong here, I'm not exactly a scholar or anything, but the way I see it, we have two options. Either the proclamation against kidnapping is only applicable to the Israelites, or the Bible contains contradictions because it also lays out several instances where kidnapping is entirely permissible. Also worth mentioning is that the word used in Exodus that is translated as someone is a specifically masculine word, meaning that this anti-kidnapping law is only applicable to men. So once again, the women get the short end of the stick in the Bible. And so this idea that you could take somebody against their will and make them your slave was not only against the law, but it was outside of the will of God. That is just flat out not true, or at least is explicitly contradicted in several other places where the Bible makes it clear that the taking of slaves is fine. Number five, slavery was limited to just six years for the Hebrew men and no one else. And so the idea here is that it was never God's heart for the rich to overtake or control the poor. On the contrary, this system was set up so that slaves or people who were in debt could work off their debt in a safe and loving environment. Yeah, <laughs> safe and loving environment? Yeah, right. Last I checked, an environment that comes with the potential threat of having my family held hostage is not a safe and loving environment. Do you remember that? The verse that you had to chop up to actually make it look, well, I can't say good because it still didn't, but less bad? And then after six years, they were not only to go free, but also the master was commanded as an act of kindness to put something in their hands and send them on their way, which was in direct contrast to what has been practiced in our country. Here's the thing, though. These ancient laws were very specific about who they applied to. They applied to the ancient Hebrews. That's it. In the verse leading up to this, it specifies Hebrew man and Hebrew woman. The non-Hebrews remain slaves. And actually, I'm kind of shocked that you decided to butcher the verse in Exodus about a slave wanting to remain a slave instead of going to the equivalent verses in Deuteronomy, such as what you are showing now. After all, Exodus explicitly states that the Hebrew women and children stay slaves, while these verses in Deuteronomy explicitly state that the Hebrew women go free in the year of Jubilee as well. 
So, yeah, it is an explicit contradiction, but the Deuteronomy one can at least be made to look not so bad with less editing than the Exodus one. And if I'm honest, I actually had to resist the urge to not even show this verse because it goes against what I said earlier about the indentured servitude rules only applying to Hebrew men. But I'm not dishonest enough to purposely omit context that is crucial to the points that I'm making. And the only reason that I can think of for why Christians don't default to this passage when talking about indentured servitude is that, while it does explicitly include women, it also explicitly excludes non-Hebrews, and since the Bible is pretty misogynistic everywhere else anyway, it's easier to explain away the exclusion of women than it is to explain away the exclusion of everybody of non-Hebrew heritage. Number six, slave owners were to treat slaves with respect. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 25 that slave owners were commanded to treat slaves as employees or hired workers in terms of the type of work that they gave them. Dude, the verse that you are using to come to that conclusion is literally four verses away from the one where it says where you can go for your actual permanent slaves that you can beat to your heart's content and force to do the bad jobs. The key word in verse 39 is brother. Brother here is referring to a fellow Hebrew, as is made obvious by the fact that just a few verses later, you are told to treat the foreigners in a way that would be explicitly forbidden by the rules about how to treat your brother. Not only this, but if a slave owner was guilty of killing a slave, he would be facing severe punishment himself. Yeah, that's what verse 20 says. Now let's continue on to verse 21. Now if the slave survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged, for the slave is his money. Now, depending on what translation you're reading, this could mean different things. The one that I just read is the ESV, and it makes it sound like you aren't punished if the slave survives a day or two but dies on the third day, which to me sounds like you're allowed to beat your slaves but not beat them to death. But if they die from an infection that results from the beating, that's not the slave owner's fault. Infections just kind of happen because, you know, they didn't know what bacteria was back then. Other translations say that the owner isn't punished if the slave recovers after a day or two. The end result here is that you are allowed to beat your slave to within an inch of their life under these rules. You're just not allowed to kill them. Also, keep in mind that Alan is comparing ancient Hebrew slavery to American slavery. No, they are not the same, but some of the justifications that he's using to defend Hebrew slavery apply to American slavery, too. In American slavery, the owners were not allowed to kill their slaves in some places, and if a judge were to find that an owner was treating his slaves with cruelty, he could order the forcible selling of those slaves. And well, Alan here hasn't brought it up, one of the defenses that I hear sometimes is that, in some instances, the punishment for killing a slave in ancient Israel was the same as the punishment for killing a non-slave, which is doubtful, but if we roll with it, then George's Constitution of 1798 said, Any person who shall maliciously dismember or deprive a slave of life shall suffer such punishment as would be inflicted in case the like offense had been committed on a free white person. So, I guess American slavery wasn't all that bad, right? After all, there were laws protecting the rights of the slaves, right? Oh, God, that felt so dirty to say. Third of all, they were commanded to maintain the family unity. And so if a slave came to you and he was already married with children after the six years were up, he and his wife and his children were to go free, which was in direct contrast to what was happening in our country. Yeah, in the Exodus rules on slavery, if a Hebrew man goes in with a wife and kids already, they all go free after the sixth year. But again, you skipped verse 4, which explicitly states that a master can give his slave a wife, and that wife and any children she has while the man is enslaved do not go free after the six years are up. That's the part where the man can declare that he doesn't want to leave them and so agrees to become a permanent slave, remember? Finally, God made it very clear that a master was buying simply the services and not the servant because it's very clear that no man can own another man like they can own an animal because all of us were created in the image of God and all of us belong to God as servants. Okay, if that's the case, then why are the women and children of an enemy city literally described as plunder? Why does Leviticus 25.45 literally refer to people that you have taken possession of as your property, with verse 46 going on to say that they can be given to your children as inherited property? And number seven, slavery was never based on race. Well, not by skin color, maybe, but definitely based on tribalism. The Hebrews are the ones that you need to be somewhat decent to. The rest you can do what you like with. 
But yeah, I'd agree that the Bible does not say that black people are the ones you can enslave. It's much less restrictive than that. Your slave can be anyone of any race or skin color, as long as they aren't a Hebrew. And so nowhere in the Bible does it condone enslaving a race of people, rather only individuals, and that on a voluntary basis. You have a funny definition of the word voluntary. So does the Bible make concessions for and have laws that regulate and ensure the proper treatment of slaves? I would have to say yes. And I would have to say no. If the law surrounding the treatment of slaves is anything other than don't have them, then that is not the proper treatment of slaves. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Lalapef Melfofo, who says, Satanism! This is Satanism! This was on one of my videos responding to a preacher who was trying desperately to squish some science into the Bible where it clearly didn't fit. All I did on that video was explain that the scientific concepts that he was reading into the text either didn't fit or were not remarkable for the Hebrew culture at the time, as there were definitely other cultures that had figured those things out by then. I am legitimately curious, what part of any of that was Satanism? I don't believe that any of the Christian gods exist, the supposedly good ones or the supposedly evil ones. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the owners of the slave that is my channel. If you'd like to hold my family hostage to coerce my continued servitude, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time time.